Thanks for tuning in to Electric Bike Journal and our first endeavor into this category of bikes, the Hardtail EMTB. So it's a Hardtail electric mountain bike, only suspension in the front, no suspension in the back. Not adventure bikes or trekking bikes that have a front suspension. These have a geometry that is relatively more made for going off-road, definitely has capabilities to go on-road, but looking to more doing more single track stuff. We're mountain bikers, we enjoy mountain biking, and we know that the category for a hardtail EMTB is pretty small, and there are still a few bikes out there that we didn't quite bring into the collection. We set a few guidelines when we were picking the bikes for the Roundup, and one of those guidelines was having a mid-drive motor e-bike with the exception of the Velotrix Summit, which is a hub drive motor bike. We just wanted to see how that would stack against these other mid-drive bikes. And it comes in at a lower price point, so we really wanted to see what it was gonna be like. Speaking of price points, we did have a price window that we were trying to keep all the bikes in. So our prices are ranging from about 1,700 up to 3,500 just with these offerings. Another guideline we set was having between a 110 and a 130 suspension fork. Along with suspension from fork, hydraulic disc brakes was really important to us for this test. Um, there are a lot of bikes out there with mechanical disc brakes which work, um, but when it comes to mountain biking, you really want hydraulic disc brakes. They perform a lot better and are more dependable on the trail. And they all have app connectivity. App connectivity is kind of where we're at with electric bikes, so it's nice to see them all there. And they all have very good apps that work well with them. Let's go through a quick overview of all of these bikes. We don't want to get too detailed in there because we do have full reviews of each one of these bikes if you want to check those out. Let's start with the Aventon Rambless. The Aventon Rambless is a class one electric bike and it has the Aventon A100 250 watt mid-drive motor with 750 watt of peak power. It has 100 newton meters of torque and it uses a 708 watt hour battery that is integrated into the frame. The wheels are 29 inches and they have 29 by 2.4 inch tires on them. The fork has 130 millimeters of travel. The drivetrain is the SRAM NX Eagle 12 speed drivetrain and it has SRAM DB8 hydraulic disc brakes with 200 millimeter rotors up front and 180 millimeter rotors in the rear. The Aventon Rambless weighs 54 pounds and has a price tag of $2,699. Next, we have the Specialized Turbo Taro 3.0. The Taro is a class three electric bike with a Specialized 2.0 E 250 watt mid-drive motor. And that motor has 50 Newton meters of torque. The battery on the Turbo Taro is 530 watt hours and it has 29 inch wheels with 2.35 inch tires. The front fork has 110 millimeters of travel and the drivetrain is a Shimano Alivio 9-speed drivetrain with Shimano MT200 hydraulic disc brakes and 180 millimeter rotors both front and rear. The Terra weighs about 48 pounds and starts at a price point of $3,250 and can go up to $5,000. They do have a full suspension model available as well. Next up, we have the Trek Marlin Plus. The Marlin Plus is a class one electric bike and it uses a Bosch Active Line Plus 250 watt hour motor that has a peak power output of 600 watts. It has 50 newton meters of torque and uses a 400 watt hour Bosch compact tube battery. For the smaller sizes, it uses 27 and a half inch wheels and for the bigger sizes, it uses 29 inch wheels. It has a 120 millimeter travel fork, a Shimano Dior 12 speed drivetrain with Shimano MT4100 four piston brakes with 203 millimeter rotors. The Trek Marlin Plus weighs around 50 pounds and has a price range starting at $2,699, but can go up to $3,499 depending on this component spec that you pick. And last up in the group test is the Velotrix Summit 1. The Summit 1 is our only class two bike on test. It has a Velo Power 750 watt rear hub drive motor with a 1300 watt peak output. Torque comes in at 90 Newton meters and it has a battery size of 750 watt hours. The Summit 1 is also the only 27 and a half inch wheeled bike on test with 2.6 inch wide tires. Up front, there is 130 millimeters of travel and it uses a Shimano Acera eight speed drivetrain with Shimano hydraulic disc brakes and 180 millimeter rotors. The Summit One is the heaviest bike on test at 65 pounds. 
Um, but it's the cheapest bike on test coming in at $17.99. So we've had these bikes for a few months and we've been riding them in a variety of different situations. And we have got a pretty solid idea about who they would be for and which ones we would choose if we only had to pick one for our garage. I mean, you had a chance to ride the Aventon down in Southern California. You've been riding up here in Portland area. Let's start there, the Aventon Rambless. How has that bike been for you? Um, kind of your pros and cons. Let's hear it. Yeah, so I initially got to go ride at the press camp, which was awesome because I did not expect this coming from Aventon, especially with the mid-drive motor and they've developed it in-house. So they've got to tweak it themselves, which is pretty neat. But and overall, I really enjoy that bike. I've had fun riding at the trails close to my house, had fun in Southern California, and even some of the other trails around Portland. So Aventon uses their own drive unit on the Rambless. It's their first mid-drive unit that they have on any of their bikes. How, how is it? It's pretty powerful from my experience, but I wanna hear your thoughts first. For sure, it's very powerful. Most of the time I'm not even in the turbo or boost mode because it's too fast on the trail. I like to ride in trail just because it won't launch me off the road or anything like that. And honestly, compared to these other ones, I feel the power difference for sure. Yeah. So if you really got some steep terrain, that's the bike I would choose. And if you're just trying to go fast everywhere, I really like how the Aventon Rambliss's motor responds to each pedal stroke. Riding it on the trail, the geometry actually feels pretty nice to me. Like I feels like a mountain bike, which is great. It doesn't yeah. feel like just like a hybrid bike or a bike that is called a mountain bike, but can't handle the mountains. And coming in at 5'8", the size medium fits me super well, has a nice reach and pretty decent stack height on there. But you're a bit taller than me. What do you think of that? Yeah, I'm a little bit taller. I actually would say that the medium wasn't too far off. Um, there's definitely a lot of elements of it from a mountain biking standpoint for the size that the medium is probably what I would still prefer, although I probably should be on the large. I did feel like the stack height, um, which stack height is just the bars to the ground in that measurement. I did feel like it was pretty tall. It does have the longest fork on there at 130 millimeters of travel, um, but I didn't really feel like it was the fork's fault that it was so tall. It's just the overall geometry. And I also felt like the reach wasn't unbearable. Uh, having that dropper post, getting the seat down and being able to ride on the back was probably what made this more fun and enjoyable to ride. Kind of reeling back a little bit, getting into the fit and finish of the Rambliss. I, I think they've done a good job with this bike. I think they do a good job with most of their bikes for having the full package of presentation that looks really good. The finish on the Aventon Rambliss is definitely nice. You see that nice faded green color on there and the welds are nicely smoothed out as well. And it does have integrated lights in that rear chainstay as well as it does come with a headlight, which is optional to put on. So I think that's really neat. It's a good looking bike overall as well. The overall details, the chain guard and, and just like kind of that integration of the tail lights, those aren't common things we see in mountain bikes necessarily, but it's definitely meant for the around town use and, and being able to tell cars and other people on the road, like, hey, I'm braking. Um, but I think that their display, their controller, all of it looks really good and it works, which is most important. And it's not distracting on the bars as well. I, I know that I am more of a fan of a cleaner cockpit. They did develop all of this in-house, so that does work well with the app that they have. So if you get the Aventon app, you can go in there and really fine tune how you want this motor to react when you are pedaling on a trail, which is pretty cool. Yeah, in my, my time riding it, I definitely stuck it in that full turbo boost mode and just left it at full power because I wanted to see the full capabilities of it. Uh, it is very impressive. It does go uphill very well. I did feel a little bit of a delay and I'm sure that's something you could tune in the app to make it more responsive in those shorter pedal strokes. But because you can tune that, I won't dock any points against it. Uh, but overall, I, the Rambliss is um, a solid, solid contender and uh, I am shocked honestly to see um, that price point a fully in-house design, a first of for the brand, um, be ranking pretty high. Let's go into the Specialized Taro. What did you think about that bike? You've had it longer than I have. I've had it for quite a while. Um, I do a lot of riding with it around town. All of these bikes, very capable on, on the road. Um, the Taro definitely, I think of the mix, maybe with the exception of the Velotric, is the most comfortable uh, riding around. It has a lot of power. It's class three, unlike the rest of these. So it's nice to get up to speed, go really fast. And Specialized has a brand that makes really good mountain bikes. And to me, I kind of like it. It's more rugged looking. That dark green looks really good. We do have the step through frame option of this. They're 
are high step normal frame designs, um, but we kind of wanted to shake things up a bit as well in the test and not only have standard high top tube bikes, uh, we wanted to show that a step through frame could work in this environment as well. Um, and I haven't noticed it once. Uh, while riding, going down trails, I don't even think about the fact that it is a step through frame design. And when I am riding around town or I need to get off at a trail, it's kind of nice to just be able to pull your foot over instead of swinging your leg all the way around. Yeah, the Taro looks good. I like that mid-step as well because it makes it easier to get on and off the bike. That green color is very nice. It's got some nice welds and it's specialized. You know, they're good bikes and they're known for their mountain bikes and high-end road bikes as well. So this does come with, I feel like a specialized price point, yeah. but you get that network of dealers that has specialized and you can get parts for them wherever yeah. you want to. Yeah, you're definitely paying for the name a little bit there, but when you, I mean, mountain bikes, they're abused uh, if you're riding them the right way. Uh, and to be able to have that support network um, from dealers across the country, you know, you can be on a road trip somewhere and if something happened to you on a ride, going to find a specialized dealer in that town guaranteed talking about that componentry the performance aspect of things i feel like the motor's fun like i think it's totally fine it might be a little underwhelming on some of the steeper climbs steeper trails which makes me feel like it's not genuinely meant to be ridden aggressively all the time um, but it's capable out there it just might be more favorable in a more relaxed recreational environment um, which makes me think of you know you know my parents or someone else that wants to go out for a ride and these trails that we've been riding here today are kind of the perfect spot for the extreme side of things for it very groomed smooth trails decent elevation but nothing really chunky and aggressive to make you feel like you're on the wrong bike in that environment. Um, but there's definitely some trails that I've taken the other bikes on that are more aggressive that I don't know if I would jump on the Taro first to go ride that. Granted, there is the Taro X full suspension, which- Different ca maybe. different category. I know. But yeah, I, I felt I felt the power of the Taro was under, not underwhelming, like it has it. Like it, once you get pedaling, it's good. And the fact that it is class three, you can, you know, go a little faster on the flats, which makes it feel nice. and. Going downhill, you don't really need to worry about what class bike it is. It, uh, yeah, I thought the class three aspect of that bike is nice, which kind of leads me to think that it is better for more, you know, maybe 70, 30, like you riding on the street, getting to the trail really fast, just to get a little kick in the afternoon. And then you can just cruise back home. It has a lot of rack capability and stuff like that as well, yeah. which is cool. But I think um, it handled pretty well on the road and I, you know, dirt, not so much. I would lean more towards road mm -hmm. slash gravel trail on that bike. Yeah, I felt kind of higher up on it, just the way you sit and ride it. Um, I'm a little bit larger for that frame again. Um, so it definitely felt a little bit small for me. Yeah, as a whole, I, I think it definitely lands more in that, yeah, 70, 30 kind of split between open gravel paths, commuting around town, and then kind of Billy going through some little bit of trails with, uh, more conservative energy. Next up, we got the Trek Marlin, which to me is my favorite looking bike because I'm just a fan of purple bikes. I think they look good. And this Trek has a nice color scheme going on with it for sure. Another thing that's great about this Trek is there is that network of Trek dealers out there. But I actually thought the Trek Marlin Plus handled really well. Like it was really familiar, like a mountain bike. Right when you got on it, you're like, okay, I'm on a mountain bike. And you notice that really when it started to get a little steeper, a little rowdier, it was just a very familiar feeling mountain bike. Yeah. Uh, playful. Yeah, more playful than the others, I would say. I think that just has to do with just Trek and their yeah. geometry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they set out to make a hardtail electric mountain bike. The, the Trek Marlin is a bike in their lineup. It's a hardtail mountain bike. It's fun. It's playful. It's really meant to go hit those trails real fast. And they did a good job at kind of bringing that same mindset over into an e version of it i i definitely feel really good on it i definitely want to change the handlebars for myself but that's the only detail uh, the rest of it feels great i feel like the size is great for me i do like this spec setup on it i i, I think everything works really well um, it breaks nice mm -hmm. it has plenty of power to ride where you need to go and the suspension works it, it's tunable i was able to set the air pressures it has a lockout and the Shimano Dior drivetrain is a drivetrain that I like. Um, 
you know, there are some steps above it, but I think that this spec is great and spec that I would put on my own personal bike if I had to. For me, I loved the Trek Marlin going downhill. It was most playful. It felt the most familiar mountain bike wise. The motor, I wish it had a little more in there. I know it's just the Bosch active line and you, we did tune it up so you can have more power output out of it. But some of the Seeper stuff, I just really wanted the power like I felt in like the Aventon has that 100 new meters of torque, which was pretty cool. And if you get yeah, to something almost, steep. Almost three times more torque. Yeah, but also bigger battery, a little heavier. So that probably affected the downhill aspect of the Rambliss. And that's why the Marlin Plus was definitely most playful going downhill bike. And my favorite looking one for sure. Just wish, wish I had like a little more. If it was an active line, plus plus or something like that. Like 75 newton meters of torque, I feel like would be a sweet spot for that bike. And it fit me well as well, coming in probably at the mid to lower level of size for that bike. The reach was good and standover height and everything else felt really nice on that bike. I, I agree, the, the Active Line Plus is a great motor. It's Bosch, it does everything great. You have the newest generation, so the app integration and you can tune it, um, but I, you know, I'm spoiled. I want a performance line on there. I, I doesn't have to be class three. Yeah, I've definitely done some longer extended miles on end, very steep climbs. And it kind of gets to a point where you're like, oh, I forget that it's not a performance line and it doesn't quite have that little extra ump I need. Um, super fun to ride because it is playful and snappy and it makes those more mellow trails more fun because you're looking for those little offshoots to really bounce around and enjoy the ride. And now we have a little bit of an outlier, which is the Velatrix Summit, just because that does have that hub motor, but it does come with that price point of $17.99, so a lot of people are going to be looking at that. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, looking at the collection, some of these bikes can cost quite a bit more, um, more than double of what the Velatrix Summit 1 is, and I think it was important to have a bike that we felt comfortable to ride on trail treat it as a mountain bike and have it be under that $2,000 price point. Um, when you're looking at a bike under $2,000, you're likely looking at a hub drive motor. Um, and in a mountain biking perspective, having that additional weight in the back can impact the performance. Uh, it not even can, it does impact the performance and impact the feel of riding it on trails. I feel that, I feel very planted to the ground, um, which some of you, that might be okay and that might be comfortable. The trails that you have locally, we know that a bike like this um, compared to the rest of these isn't necessarily a no for a lot of people. And I was reminding myself of that while riding it. I think that Velatrix done a good job at kind of doing the best that they can component wise, spec wise for keeping things affordable. Um, for starters, you know, they're, they're doing their in-house Velo Power Drive unit. It's very powerful. You are not looking for power at all while riding this bike. Uh, if anything, you're looking for traction. That was the number one thing I noticed is that it has so much power that on the really steep stuff, getting the pedal in or using the throttle, uh, getting enough weight and traction on the rear tire was something harder to do because it just wants to spin and spin and spin and shoot you on up. Um, but on the descending side, the brakes are Shimano spec brakes. Uh, they're series brakes, so they're kind of out of the window, but they still work equally as well as the MT4100s and the MT200s. And it has a tunable air shock up front, so you can set your rider weight and really micro tune that in to perform pretty well for that bumpy terrain that you're gonna get while mountain biking. Yeah, I think the Summit is more of a, for me, I would not take it on single track as much like we were riding today, more of like gravel pass stuff. And mm -hmm. it is nice because it does have that throttle. So if you're just feeling a little lazy, you could jump on that throttle. I uh, just, yeah, it is it is quick. It's got like that, with the throttle is quick. I didn't feel the power as much when I was pedaling just cause I, I don't know, maybe wasn't just hitting the, hitting the torque sensor as hard as I needed to be. But when I was feeling like I needed to get up a little section, I would hit the throttle and get up there. But with that price point of $17.99, that's a bike I could recommend to someone who's gonna be mostly gravel path, less steep, turny stuff. Cause it is a bit longer as well for the reach. So yeah. I think that bike, it has a place here for sure. Yeah. And it, it, that front suspension fork does its good job when you're hitting some of those bumpy things, so. And we and we talked about the integration aspect with the Aventon, and I think, you know, it's hard to pass that up in talking about it on the Bellatrix is there is a lot of integration that's popular with their brand and all the other bikes in the lineup. But 
you know, it has a tail light that's integrated up high into the seat, um, which is really nice. It does have a headlight. You know, you get those creature comforts that you would look for in a commuter, um, but something that you can have with you if you decide to go hit that trail after work or something on the way home and might be losing light. The Velotrek, uh, although it's something that you can take out on trails, it's just the overall finished package is favorable more for someone that isn't going to be out properly mountain biking you know we're looking at gravel paths we're looking at some really chill mellow single track i think the bello trek kind of for me sits a little outside of the category um, despite their best efforts to really make an offering to fit into the mountain bike category. I'm going to agree with you here that the bello trek is on the bottom end of the scale here not because it's a bad bike but for this application of really wanting to take it on single track and calling it a mountain bike just not for me for this situation. Now, I wouldn't hesitate for a second to go out for a ride with my dad and have him on the Summit One and me on one of the other ones or switch back and forth. Let him ride a different one that's more capable and I'll hop on that one. I'm gonna have just as much fun, um, but I'm gonna know the threshold and limitations of where that bike will perform. You know, choosing a bike to keep around to ride, obviously as a mountain biker, I'm gonna be looking for full suspension more up, but as hardtails, I would go with the Trek for many reasons. Um, and it's not, I think, all of the reasons a lot of people would necessarily go with. I like the different options for frame sizes. I can get the right size for me. I think Trek, as a brand that's established, been around in the bike industry for a long time, makes very, very nice mountain bikes. They've got it right. They, they made a proper mountain bike, geometry rise. It's, it's trail ready and ready to go. Those elements of a little bit lackluster in the motor power, something I can overlook for the application of riding this bike. Um, the fork, although it's, I think the best one that we have on test is something that I would still upgrade. Um, and I would probably change out the stem and handlebars to something that fit me a little bit better. I, I think the Trek overall, you know, delivered to your door kind of package is ready to go turnkey and gonna really create the best riding experience. And that's on my side, how about you? Yeah, I mean, the, I'm torn between two of the bikes. I like the, the Trek, the colorway, just great looking bike. But if I had to take one home, I would pick the Aventon Rambless just because I it just had the most fun. It's fast for me, like I'd like the torque. I live in a steeper part of town, so being able to power up that is really nice. And Aventon actually has a good network of dealers too. So you can get, you can get this bike pre-assembled and you can also go test drive it if you need to. Yeah. It isn't my favorite fork out of the bunch, actually. Like, I don't like that it doesn't have a lockout. So if you are gonna do a really long climb, that's just something you have to think about. It does handle well. It has the most travel, which is great for what I like to do, going down the steep stuff. But that's something I would definitely change over time. I would just save up a little money, get a better fork on there. You're already in savings compared to some of the other ones. Which is great. And that does leave room to be able to upgrade the things I would want to possibly stem bars for sure suspension if i really really wanted to take this out a bit more yeah. overall what is nice about these bikes is they do use all that standard componentry mm -hmm. down to the wheels to the you know through axle forks for most of them that just is great that if you need to switch something you can do that to customize it to custom your fit custom your preference mm -hmm. so that is a good thing overall i mean as a whole the the hardtail emtb category we feel is a very hard category if you're looking at electric bikes and you're looking at these price points you're likely going to be looking at a full suspension electric bike but we felt it was important to shine the light on these bikes that are out there because they're still good bikes and for a lot of riders out there they very much so make sense not everyone needs full suspension and the type of riding they do and it's good to know kind of where each one sits and which bike is capable to really be used in that fashion. Well, there you have it, folks. That is the 2024 Hardtail EMTB Roundup. Um, again, we know there are a lot of other bikes in this category, and it's just, you know, we tried our hardest to reach out and bring more bikes in. Um, but fortunately, these guys were able to play with us, and we enjoyed riding all of them. There's not one bike here that we did not have a smile from. As a reminder, we do have the standalone reviews of each one of these bikes where we dive in fully onto the full component spec and we'll talk about them uh, to their fullest of how they perform and who they're designed for. If you have any questions on any one of these bikes, leave a comment down below. We will do the best to answer that. As always, please subscribe to our channel. It helps us grow, do more videos like this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.